Okay, welcome to the afternoon session. It's my great pleasure to introduce Pierre Youssef, who is a tenured associate professor at um, NYU Abu Dhabi, um, who's done many uh, nice work on um, asymptotic functional analysis. We've already heard some of his work in, in a previous talk today, but now he will be talking about regularized functional inequalities and applications to Markov chains. Thanks. Thanks, Erika. So I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation and for the opportunity to be here. So I'm going to talk about uh, some joint works with uh, Justin Salez and Konstantin Tikhomirov. It's about regularized functional inequalities. And here's the plan of the talk. Hopefully, I'll get to everything. So first, I'm going to introduce uh, basics of function, some classical functional inequalities and uh, what they are useful for. And then I'm going to discuss the relations between uh, those classical inequalities. And I'm going to state the main result uh, of the talk. And then we're gonna see two applications, but there are probably many others. One to the lamp lighter uh, chain and the other for the zero range process. I'll try to give a basic idea of the proof uh, using this regularization trick. And then uh, depending on time, I'm gonna, I want to discuss uh, the mixing time of the switch chain on regular bipartite graph, which also uses this regularization idea. Okay, so first uh, the setting. So uh, I'm gonna always have uh, the state space to be finite, but we are in high dimension. So uh, the size of the state space is, is very, very large. And we, te we tend to want to know uh, dependencies on, on this size. Uh, pi is a probability measure and Q is a reversible Markov generator with respect to this, uh, to this probability measure pi. And uh, usually I'm always gonna take Q to be normalized so that it's, it's coming really from uh, P minus I where P is a transition matrix. So an object of uh, which will play a big role in, in, in the talk is the Dirichlet form, uh, which is this bilinear form. It's the expectation of the Carré Duchamp operator. It's actually the Carré Duchamp is an operator measuring the, the local local variation around the point. You just average over all neighbors, and you take the variation of the functions uh, with respect to these uh, these neighbors. So we're going to say. So I'm going to directly pass to what are these classical functional inequalities that we're going to talk about. So first, for Carré inequality. We're going to say that our space, so the state space, the probability measure, and the generator satisfy a Poincare inequality with constant alpha pi if the variance, if for every function, the variance can be controlled by the Dirichlet form. So the variance is itself actually a Dirichlet form. It's a Dirichlet form with respect to the uh, trivial Markov generator, the one where you transition with respect to the stationary measure directly. And it measures basically the global variation of the function. And you're trying to control this by local variation of the function, which is given by locality is meant, is meant by the graph of the corresponding Markov chain. And alpha pi is the best constant that you can achieve this for all functions. Okay. Another inequality, which, uh, which is kind of classical, is the log Sobolev inequality, which tend to do the same, but instead of working with the variance, you now measure vari local, uh, global variation with the entropy of, of the function. And if you notice carefully, the Dirichlet form is kind of similar for both, just a change of a change of variable, and this will be important in, sev in several places for us. And finally, the modified log Sobolev inequality. This is where the left hand side is the same with respect to log Sobolev inequality. We're measuring global variation with respect to the entropy, and the right hand side is a different Dirichlet form. It's a Dirichlet form of f log f. Again, all of these are are meant for all functions f. And alpha is the best constant that achieves that achieves. Okay, all good. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me, even if we get, we don't get to everything in the talk. Doesn't matter. So, what is this useful for? So, the first thing, I mean, I I, I personally landed into this because of the concentration of measure phenomena. So, uh, the basic problem is that you have you are given a function and you would like to understand how well concentrated it is around its expectation. So we'd like to understand the tails of the probability that F deviates from its expectation. And one common way to do this is to use Chernoff bound and to, to get to control the moment generating function. So the expectation of E to the lambda F for, for, for all lambda. So this is how you can use those functional inequalities because we had, for instance, a control on the variance for every function in particular for this function. And then you can use Poincaré inequality to get that the moment generating function of at two lambda, because you're taking uh, the square of this one, 
is controlled by the moment generating function plus the Poincare constant times the corresponding Dirichlet form. Remember, the Dirichlet form is measuring local variation here of exponential lambda f, but you can, of course, relate the difference of exponential lambda f to the difference of f, which is the Carré Duchamp of f times the moment generating function itself. And then you get a bootstrapping inequality, which you can iterate to get, uh, to get uh, a bound on the moment generating function from which you can control the tails of, of this distribution. And this argument is due to Idan's truth. And it tells you that if you have a Poincaré inequality, you can have an exponential uh, control on, on, the, on the deviation from the expectation. And the deviation depends actually on the Poincaré constant and the local variations, which are given by the Carré Duchamp. Now, if you have a log solve of inequality, you can actually get more. You can get sub Gaussian concentration. And this is, this is what is known as Herb's argument. So it's really uh, based on this trivial observation is that if you take the derivative of the logarithm of the moment generating function, you get exactly a quantity which depends on the entropy. And then you can use the logarithmic solve of inequality or the modified logarithmic solve of inequality to bound this quantity here, which is the entropy, you can bound it above by the corresponding directly form, which again, you can relate it to the variation of the function itself, so the Carré Duchamp and the moment generating function itself simplifies. So you get a differential inequality, which you can solve to get a bound on the moment generating function. And this is how you can get sub Gaussian concentration using log solve of inequality. And actually here, you can get the same from the modified log solve of inequality as well. Yeah, so this is, this is, I mean, one of the uses of the, these functional inequalities, you, they capture uh, very well uh, the concentration of measure phenomena. So the way you could, you could use it is that you are given a probability measure and you'd like to understand the concentration phenomena for, for this probability measure. What you can do is that you can try to cook up a Markov generator, which converts to this, to, which has this measure as a stationary measure. And then by measuring the local variation along this Markov chain, you can capture concentration of the original point. So there is always a game in choosing the right Markov generator so that you can control the corresponding log sublet constant, but also you can control the local variation with respect to the graph of this Markov. So uh, by themselves, actually, those functional inequalities are actually interesting just because they, they really tell us about the ergodicity of the Markov generator. So the Poincaré inequality is itself equivalent to the L2 exponential ergodicity. So if you look at PT to be the semigroup associated to this Markov generator, and you look at the decay of PTF, it's actually exactly controlled by the rate of decay exponentially is exactly controlled by the Poincaré constant. Similarly, the modified log solve of inequality is actually equivalent also to a decay of the, of the Markov semigroup, but to the entropic decay of the Markov semigroup. So you can, you can control the decay of the entropy of PTF with respect to the entropy of F. And logarithmic solve of inequality, as we'll see, is actually strictly stronger, is equivalent to what we call the hyperconjectivity, which is, again, a sort of decay of, uh, of the norm of PTF, but it's measured in terms of LP, LQ norm, with Q depending on, on the logarithmic solve of inequality uh, constant. Okay, so as you can see, since, since those inequalities, those constant actually pump up naturally in, in the decay of, uh, decay of the rate of convergence of the semigroup, they are actually related to the mixing time of, of, of those Markov chains. So I'm gonna define the mixing time to be the total variation mixing time. So it's the first time where a PT, the transition matrix at time T is actually one over four close to, to the, <laughs> to the stationary measure. So by what, by what we saw in the previous slide, we can directly deduce some bound on the mixing time in terms of one carré constant, log sub left constant, and modified log sub left. So in all inequalities, you will see in the talks, whenever I put an inequality like this, <coughs> sorry, I mean, it's up to a universal constant. The constant does not depend neither on the state space nor on anything else. <coughs> okay, so as you see, uh, the mixing time is better captured by the log sub -life constant and the modified log sub -life constant because we get log log of one of the, one over the minimum probability. So the size of the state space. So for current inequality only capture it up to, up to. Okay, so, uh, I mean, from what I've discussed so far, it's kind of clear that 
Lock Sobolev and modified Lock Sobolev are kind of stronger than Poincare inequality. They are getting us better conclusions. So we expect that it is actually stronger and it is indeed the case. So you always have that if you have a logarithmic Sobolev inequality, then you have a modified log logarithmic Sobolev inequality and you have a Poincare inequality. And we actually have, have more, <coughs> we have a precise actually comparison of the constant so we have that the Poincaré constant over two is actually smaller than the modified logarithmic Solev constant, which is smaller than logarithmic Solev constant over four. So we have a complete understanding of like kind of uh, the, the hi hi hierarchy of those inequalities. And we, what we would like to understand in this talk is actually the reverse. So can we go from, from logarithmic Solev to, I mean, from Poincaré to logarithmic Solev from MLSI to logarithmic Solev inequality? So the answer is of course, no, because those inequalities are strictly st stronger one, one to another, but there is a cost. And what is the cost of reversing these inequalities? And that's what we're gonna do. So first of all, let's check how can we reverse the relation between the Poincare constant and log the logarithmic Solev. So as you can see from, as I said at the beginning, they share kind of the same Dirichlet form. <laughs> the only difference is kind of the, how you measure the global variation. So one of them you're measuring the global variation with respect to the variance. The other one is with respect to the entropy. So it's just about comparing entropy to variance. So if I look at the entropy of a function, it's just expectation of F log F over expectation of F. And I can just use cauchy schwarz inequality to put the square outside here. And then I can use Jensen's inequality to basically add this subtraction term here. And then I'm gonna just use a basic inequality, uh, equality basically, uh, a square minus b square. I'm gonna write it as a minus b times a plus b. And then I'm gonna divide and multiply by the, by the function so that I, I, I make this, this guy appear here. You have to trust me at some point with the calculation. So, uh, so I get to this, this, this identity that the entropy is smaller than the expectation of square root of F minus expectation of square root of S squared times, which is kind of the variance. This is what you would like up to this additional term. So if I can get rid of this additional term, I, I would have gained. Now, if you look at this function H, this function as X is growing is behaving like log X. So if I can say that this input here is bounded above, I can bound this whole thing by log of this. So let's look at this, this object, square root of F over expectation of square root of F is actually smaller than one over the minimum of the probability. So uh, by this, you can just pay a price of log of one over the minimum of the probability and you get the comparison between the entropy and the variance. <coughs> and as a consequence, a comparison between logarithmic solve of inequality and the Poincare, the Poincare constant. So you can reverse this relation up to a cost and the cost is a global cost, of course, because we were comparing global quantities, which is log of one over the minimum of the probability. And this is actually sharp if you think of it. So if you think of the random walk on the complete graph, or if you think of just the trivial chain where you mix in one step, you move, uh, your transition is exactly the stationary measure, then the logarithmic solve of constant is exactly log of one over the minimum probability and all carry constants is equal to one. So this is sharp in this respect, okay? So it, it is achieved. So the goal of uh, the talk is basically to talk about the relation between modified log solev and log solev inequality. So of course I can use this relation. This relation is still valid for MLSI and, and Poincaré, for instance. I can say MLSI is smaller than LSI, which is itself smaller than this one. Or it's not very nice because you would expect that the relation between MLSI and LSI is, is actually a local relation because they share the same global parameter, which is the entropy, and it's only differentiating on the local level. And this is actually what we've done with, with Justin and, and Constantin. So we proved that the logarithmic Solev constant is actually bounded up to universal constant here by the modified log Solev constant times a cost, which is log of one over the minimum of the transition made, okay? minimum of, of, of your generator. So, so for instance, if you think of a random walk on a, on a sparse graph, this, this here is just a constant basically. It's log, log of the maximum degree 
of this graph, which is which is a constant. So this is actually telling us something extremely. I mean, like I, I, we're really surprised this was not observed before. So logarithmic solve of inequality and modified logarithmic solve of inequality are actually the same for R two. So uh, okay, so so now that we have this, so we have a complete picture of what's happening. By the way, yeah, this is sharp as well, because as we will see later, maybe that the transposition chain on on permutation. This one is of order n log n, this one is of order n, and this is log n. So it's actually achieved. But I mean, it's always strange to say it's sharp because what does it mean to be sharp? But by sharp, I mean here that there is an example which achieves it. But still, it would be nice actually to understand when is like a better characterization of when this inequality is achieved or when it's actually not sharp. Okay, so uh, so from what I've done so far, I mean, you may find it strange that we are trying to reverse this inequality because as far as mixing was concerned, as far as concentration was concerned, basically MLSI was already giving us everything. Why do I need to go to get a bound on LSI to get anything, right? So what, what is this useful for? So it's actually useful, question? Okay, so questions are, <coughs> sorry, uh, what is this useful for? So, so first of all, LSI is actually, if we're talking theoretically, even without thinking of the application, it is actually strictly st stronger than MLSI. So we're getting a bound on the logarithmic solve constant, which is in itself a stronger statement than just saying about MLSI. LSI itself also captures uh, isoparametric profiles because we can apply LSI for zero one valued functions and you would get uh, you would get a control on the expansion of small sets in, in your uh, in your graph of the Markov chain. Another thing which we which is, is it is useful for so uh, as I said LSI and Poincaré inequalities they share the same Dirichlet form, and this Dirichlet form itself just by by its actually structure it's amenable to comparison. You can you can perturb your Markov chain a little bit and then you can do comparison procedure between the corresponding chain and you can transfer bound. This is actually very common in, in the theory of Markov chain that you can prove some, some mixing bound on, on the Markov chain. You, you perturb the Markov chain and you can get the mixing time for another Markov chain just by comparison procedure. So this comparison procedure works very well for Poincaré inequality and for log solid inequality just because of the structure of the corresponding Dirichlet form. This is completely not true for MLSI. So, you, there are no comparison procedure for modified log solve inequality. So passing from LSI to LSI opens the door completely to establishing comparison procedures. Okay, so this allows us to basically transfer bounds from one chain to another, as we will see actually in, in some application. Another thing is, imagine you know now LSI for some chains in the literature, you know the, you know the logarithmic solve inequality, which only gives you an upper bound on the modified log solve constant, and from what our result, you can get actually a lower bound on alpha MLSI. So you can actually use the result in both ways to get an upper bound on the logarithmic solve of inequality, but you can also use it the reversely to get a lower bound on the modified log solve. So let's see how, how we can use this. So for instance, this one here. So as I, <coughs> as I mentioned before, we, we can use those functional inequalities to control the mixing time. So we saw that the mixing time is controlled by MLSI constant times a double log of the size of the space. And actually Montenegro and Tetali uh, asked if it is true that we can reverse this relation. So can, is it true that the, the mixing time itself is always lower bounded by the modified log solid constant? So we've seen that the mixing time is upper bounded by this MLSI constant time times the double log. So they are asking if it is true that the reverse inequality holds. And actually Hermon and Perez also asked a similar question. It's a bit, a bit more relaxed question. They asked if it is true that the entropic mixing time is, is lower bounded by this. Entropic mixing time is just the same. You, you just measure with respect to pullback Leiber diversions instead of the total variation. And what we can get from our result is that the answer to both is no. And the example is actually very, very easy. So you consider, you consider G a graph uh, with bounded maximum degree, 
just to make things sparse. And you consider the lamp lighter chain. <coughs> so the lamp lighter chain is just you have you have a, you have a person who's walking on on the graph, and there are lamps on on each each side, and he can decide at each step to either turn on or off the light, or to move on to a neighbor. So this is called the lamp lighter chain. It's extremely well studied on several type of graphs and many, many things are known. And the logarithmic Sobolev we'll constant, for instance, is completely characterized for any graph G. It is of order N, so N is the size of the number of vertices of the graph G over the spectral gap of G. Uh, I'm not sure actually if they are the only one who obtained this, but at least this is one of the reference I found. I think there are also other works who also obtained it. But I mean, many things are studied about this chain and we're only using this one. So from our result, and this was not known, is we can now get what is so, the modified. So what, what is this uh, D? Uh... Delta? Uh, D, yes, sorry. D is the maximum degree. So D is the maximum degree of the graph. And what, what I mean by this. The constant depend on. Exactly. Yes. So here, what I mean by this is that there is a double inequality, and those inequalities have in, involve constants which depend on D. Okay. Let's we'll just suppose that D is, 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 is a bounded constant for us. So uh, as I said, yeah, as a result of, of, of our, as a consequence of our result, now we can, of course, we always know that the modified log Sobolev constant is bounded above by, by this one, but now we can know that it is bounded below up to a logarithmic term, but which depends on D. So it's actually tells us that the modified log Sobolev constant is of order N over the, the spectral gap of G. And if you just specialize this, for instance, I don't know, take G to be uh, the N cycle, uh, then you can get that the modified log solid constant is of order n cubed while actually the mixing time as i said many things are studied about this so the mixing time and the entropic mixing time are also known to be of order n square or n square log n so this already refutes the the question of of uh, montenegro titali and uh and Hermo Perez. is that we cannot bound uh, from below the mixing time by the modified log solid Another, uh, so here we use the theorem to pass from LSI to MLSI. So we, we knew what is LSI here and we wanted to understand what is MLSI. Now we're gonna use it the opposite way around. So we're gonna go from MLSI to, to LSI and we're gonna see what is the advantage of that. So I'm gonna just take an example, but I'm sure, I mean, it would be really very helpful if, if there are, if we can find actually many other applications and I'm sure there is. So the zero range process is, is an interacting particle system process. So you have M particles and N sites. So the number of particles is stable at each step and the state space is just the distribution of these uh, particles on, on these sites. And we, we are given a geometry of the sites. So this is encoded by a, by a stochastic matrix G which encodes who's connected to who and by what ring. And we have functions Ri, which are just at which speed a particle is expelled from a particular site. Okay. So the rate of, uh, of expelled, I don't know how to say it in English. So we're gonna just suppose that these speeds are kind of almost linear so we can control the difference between, between Ri, Ri of k plus one and Ri, okay. And the generator is just, as I said, you just, at the, you have a particular uh, distribution of particles in the site. You just remove a particle from site I and move it to, to site J if I and J are connected through the geometry and with rate given by this, this R. Yeah, okay, yeah. So yeah, this generator is not normalized. Let's, let's forget, it's, it's okay. So I stated my main result for normalized uh, Markov generator, otherwise you just normalize. Okay, so what is known is already, I mean, this again, like it's for any graph G. So you have, you have many, many possible applications of this. So even already the interesting case where the mean field setting where G is just a complete graph so is already interesting in itself. And actually Hermon and Celeste, and by the way, oh, here also, if there's anyone in the audience who I'm not citing, I'm sorry. So there are many people who work on, on this. So I'm just stating the results. So Hermann and Sales obtained that the modified log Sobolev constant is bounded above by the ratio of a over small a square, which were the bounds on, on the rate of, 
of the speed of uh, expelling the particle. And uh, from this, because we have a, now a control on the logarithmic solar constant in terms of for the modified logarithmic solar constant, we can get a bound on, on alpha LSI in terms of the other one. We have to just pay the price of log of the sparsity. And you can actually, this is just this short calculation to understand what is basically the sum of these, these guys here. This is, what it, this is what gives you this additional term. Okay, so why is this useful for? What is this useful for? Because now, I mean, as I said, so these people knew only to, how to control the modified log solar constant for the mean field setting. How do you pass for general geometry? Usually you do these comparison procedures. These comparison procedures are not valid for the modified log solar constant. So now by passing to logarithmic solar constant, we have access to every all comparison techniques, and now we can pass to any general geometry. So you can take G to be anything. Already Hermon and Sales did the, already did the job for us. They did the comparison procedure in the case of Poincaré inequality, which shares the same Dirichlet form as for the logarithmic solar inequality. So we can just use their comparison procedure to get a logarithmic solar left constant for arbitrary geometry. So you just have to pay the price of the spectral path. And by the way, all, everything here is 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 sharp. So uh, maybe I don't know. Maybe I don't know about the dependence on M, but everything else I think is pretty sharp. In the sense again that there is an example which matches. Good. So uh, perfect. Okay. So uh, now that I gave you two applications, which kind of covers all aspects of the theorem. So it tells you that you can use. A logarithmic solar of inequality completely characterize MLSI. You can use a theorem to get a bound on LSI knowing MLSI with the advantage that LSI gives you access to comparison procedures. So which is itself is, is very important. So let me just give you a hint of, of the proof. The proof is not difficult. It's a bit, it involves some technical considerations, but it's actually, the idea is kind of not, not difficult. So already the starting point is to understand how did, how from the beginning, why LSI was even stronger than MLSI. How, how this, this basic bound that I stated at the beginning that the MLSI constant is smaller than the LSI constant over four. How did we get this from the beginning? So let's see. So we need to compare, the, they share the same global quantity, which is the entropy. So we need to understand what happens for <coughs> the local variations, which are measured by the Dirichlet form. This is the Dirichlet form of the, of the logarithmic solar of inequality. So if you write what it is, it's just, uh, the average local variations of square root of f. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do my same trick that I did, if you remember a little bit before, I'm just gonna multiply and divide by square root of f plus square root of f so that I get, did I make a mistake here? No, I didn't make a mistake, sorry. I factored here by square root of f of x minus square root of f of y and I divided and multiplied by square root of f of x plus square root of f of y and times the log. So if you look carefully, you get exactly the Dirichlet form that you would like, which is the one of the MLSI, up to this term here, which is H of F of X minus over F of Y. Yeah. It's actually very similar to what I did when I compared entropy and variance. Just the only difference is that before, the comparison between entropy and variance was involving H of some global quantity, which is F over the expectation, while here it's H of a local quantity with, because you're taking only two neighbors, F, X, and Okay, but this function, I mean, it's, a, it's an easy function. We can just draw it. We can see what, what properties it has. So first you can, you can notice that H of Z is equal to H of one over Z. And if you study this function at on one plus infinity is actually increasing and the minimum is attained at four and it's equal to, at one, sorry, and it's equal to four. And because the minimum is four, you can bound this from uh, above by one over four times uh, the Dirichlet form of the MLSI. And this is exactly how, how we got at the beginning that the MLSI constant is bounded by one over four, the LSI constant, just because of this trivial uniform. Now the key observation, which is actually very trivial, is that we, we can reverse just this inequality if we, we can ensure that this, this, this term here, we can be bounded from above. Because this function is increasing if I can ensure that this, function it does not have like spikes. If its variation are kind of regular, then I will be able to reverse this inequality. 
So uh, yeah, if the function is regular in the sense that you can uh, locally f is not variating a lot, so f of x over f of y is smaller, is bounded by some parameter r whenever x and y are neighbors, then we will be able to bound just because now we can control this one by h of r and h of r is of order log r, as I said, you can bound, you can get the reverse inequality on the corresponding derivative. <coughs> so for regular functions, everything is nice. Okay, so the only issue is that when we are dealing with LSI or MLSI, we need to deal with all functions. So uh, for now we can pose and just define a new class of inequalities, which we can call regularized MLSI or regularized LSI, which are just the same as before, but instead of taking all class of functions, just take class of regular functions. Of course, this is weaker. And the only, the really main contribution is to say actually that this is enough. So, so there exists an R for which regularized MLSI and LSI are the same as the regular, are, are the same as the classical LSI. And LSI. So as R, of course, I mean, as R goes to infinity, you get the classical inequalities. And the whole point is to get R as small as possible. <coughs> and the technical ingredient is that we can regularize any function. So given a function, you just take basically the smallest regular function, which is above uh, your function F. And it's given actually by, you just launch passes from, from your point and you just take the maximum of the value of F at a particular vertex over R to the power distance on the graph to, to your particular starting point. And it turns out, and this is really what is the technical consideration, is that if you take R as small as one over the minimum of the, the transition probability square, you can actually reverse, reverse the relation between R regularized function inequalities and function inequalities in the sense that you can control the entropy of a function by its regularization and the corresponding Dirichlet form. And uh, yeah, here I put square, but remember we're taking the log at the end, so that's so uh, perfect. So this is what I wanted to say about uh, about uh, an idea of the proof. I cannot go in details here, but uh, this is really the main <laughs> the main trick. And this trick actually. So let me maybe just summarize first. So what did we do so far? We used this regularization trick to obtain logarithmic solve of inequality from modified logarithmic solve of inequality. So we have a now complete understanding of the relation between MLSI and LSI. So we had this inequality and now we have this one. We did this using this regularization trick. And uh, as a consequence, we saw that MLSI and LSI are actually the same for sparse chains. And uh, we use this to, to get for the Lemp-Leiter chain, which refuted those, those questions of, uh, of Montenegro Titali and Hermo Perez. And uh, we actually also did the opposite way around. We went from uh, MLSI to LSI and with the advantage that LSI is actually good for comparisons and we implemented such comparison, for instance, for the zero range process to obtain a bound for all uh, for arbitrary geometry. And uh, actually, so since we are, the way we're doing it is kind of a bit strange. So we're passing from MLSI to LSI and then we are using the fact that LSI is amenable to comparison. But we can use this regularization trick already at the level of MLSI. And this is actually what we've done previously with, with, uh, with Kostya. We, we actually use this regularization trick to actually implement comparison procedure for MLSI itself without passing through LSI. This actually allows to some gains in, in some, for some particular examples actually. And one particular example is the switch chain on bipartite graphs. So as I said at the beginning, we do not have comparison procedure for MLSI. Actually we do. When we use this regularization trick, we do have a comparison procedure. There is a cost to pay, of course, and the cost is depends on the logarithm of this regularization. But we now have also a comparison procedure for, for the MLSI concept. So for the last part of the talk, I would like to actually tell you a bit more about the switch chain on bipartite graph, unless there are questions. I, yeah, yeah, I can hear. So, I mean, here in this setting, we can, because we're working on finite, we can, everything, we can calculate everything, right? But the bound, the bounds can, can be very bad, right? Okay. 
Thank you. So I thought the point was to exactly compute the MLSI or the LSI. Yes. And so what feature of a Markov chain? So you, you sort of- um, So for instance, for the zero range process, if you, if you look carefully, people didn't know how to calculate LSI for general geometries G. Why just because, sorry, uh, MLSI for- uh, this. Yeah, So that's the question. What allows you to compute the LSI and not the MLSI or vice versa? So uh, easily. Okay, I see what you mean. So why in some examples yeah. you can prove it? But I mean, if you get a bound on LSI, you can get a bound on, on MLSI, right? Fair enough, yeah. But like uh, I thought the point was to get sort of sharp comparisons. And in some examples, people already computed the LSI but could not do it for the MLSI and then vice versa. And yeah. does the question make sense? Uh, I'm yeah, 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 I see what you mean. Uh, do I have an example in mind? Yeah, I can think of an example later on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes you may be able to get uh, to calculate both. It's just that maybe the inequality you will get is not is not the sharp one, and while here you get you get the right relation between the two. But yeah, what makes and as I said, I mean, your question I think goes in the right in the direction of what I was saying that when I said our result is sharp. What does it mean exactly to be sharp? Okay, it is sharp in the sense that we have an example for which it's achieved, but it doesn't tell us anything about the structure of of those Markov chain. When is this mark? When, for which Markov chains do we have that LSI and MLSI coincide? For which Markov chain they are different, etc. So, it goes kind of in the same direction that you're saying. What structure on the Markov chain allows to calculate one and not the other? I think here we're, we're a bit cheating, but the, in the sense that I'm I'm pretty sure that we can directly cook up a lower bound. Lower bounds are usually very easy. But I mean, kind of, we have it for free in a sense. Yeah. This was just to, to, to add an additional feature. But yeah, lower bounds you can get for free. But yeah, good question. Yes. So I, I don't know what is done in the literature. So I think this is one of the main assumptions that is usually made, but I'm not, I'm not aware of uh, other works. Maybe there are. Yeah, yeah of course, of course. Yeah, yeah but yeah, I, I don't know. But the literature is huge on this, I'm sure. But yeah, I, I don't. Okay, so let me just so very briefly, try to be quick on the switch chain on regular bipartite graphs. So, so obj the object of interest are regular bipartite graphs on n vertices. They are uh, deregular, and the goal is to generate them. How to generate a uniformly a, uh, a deregular bipartite graph? And uh, a natural Markov chain to define here is this switching chain. What it does is that it looks at the graph, looks at two parallel edges which do not have crossings and it just switches them. Okay. So you destroy this edge, you destroy this edge, and then you switch them. I actually usually, my, my head works much better in matrices. So I look at the edge ACC matrices and you look at the minor inside this matrix and you just switch this minor from one, zero, zero, one to zero, one. So this Markov chain is actually, so, uh, so yeah, the notation I define the bipartite graph to be the set of all the regular bipartite graph and the corresponding uniform measure on it. And this, this is a Markov chain I just described. You just pick two parallel edges and uh, switch them if it's possible. If, if it's not, if it creates a multiple edge, you don't, you stay where you are. And uh, it's possible to check that this one uh, converge to the, to the uniform measure. And uh, the whole goal is to understand at what speed, what is the mixing time. And uh, yeah, and here I define also the relaxation time, which is, which is related to the spectral gap. Uh, it's actually related to Poincare a constant. Maybe let's not talk about this. The mixing time is what I defined before. And the relations which are here are exactly the relation kind of that we stated before between Poincare and log uniform. Just to keep in mind that here, one over the minimum probability is log of the size of the space and the size, the number of 
bipartite deregular graph is of order, the logarithm of it is of order n d log. So whatever bound you get, you will have to pay a price of, 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 of that. And what was known about uh, the mixing time, uh, so there was a result of Kananted, Titali, and Vampawa, who proved that the mixing time is of order, is upper bounded by nd to the 13. And this was later improved by n to the 7, d to the 18. And actually, so I learned from Catherine Greenhill and Prasad also confirmed it that this was wrong here. There was a mistake in this. I think we should still cite uh, because it's published. So, and yeah, here I stated many, uh, many names who contributed to this and uh, Catherine Greenhill basically contributed a lot to studying, not just on bipartite graphs, but on other uh, non-regular graphs or, or others. And uh, yeah, maybe before I say the results, so the conjecture is that it should be ND log N. So what we proved uh, with Kostya is that as a degree D, for any degree D, as long as it is kind of, doesn't grow too much, so it's, smaller than n to some power, random power. The relaxation time is of order nd, and uh, this is sharp. And the mixing time is bounded by nd squared log nd, so it's off by a factor nd. And if d is fixed, independent of, of n, we actually can prove the optimal bound that it is of order n log. And uh, I'll try to, try to tell you a little bit what goes into this because there is a also regularization and there are some nice mathematics in it uh, which <coughs> hopefully relate to i mean in a loose sense to what offer was talking about this is not working anymore slide perfect yeah so what goes into this is that as i said we instead of proving the bound on the mixing time, we actually prove functional inequality, which itself is actually stronger. So we prove a Poincaré inequality, that the Poincaré inequality holds with constant nd. A uh, modified log solve inequality holds with constant n if d is fixed, and n log n if d is fixed as well. And all of those results are actually sharp. So uh, it's just a passage from this to, to, uh, to the mixing time, which is lacking. And I'll explain it a little bit later. So uh, I actually, I can skip this. So I think you believe me that they are sharp. Uh, so here, there was an example to, to say why it is sharp, but let me pass through this. <coughs> the main idea here is actually to implement a comparison procedure. So to understand to what, what to compare with, uh, you, we need to understand actually how, how regular graph, I mean, how people generate regular graph in, in, in the literature. And one, one way to do this is the configuration model. So the configuration model does the following. So you just list your n vertices on the left, n vertices on the right, create a bucket of d, of d uh, tubes from each, d tubes from each, and then match them randomly. This will create, of course, something which is deregular. But after you finish this, you can suppress the buckets. But if you do this, you may have created multiple edges. But everything is calculable here. We can already work on the multigraph level on the, the one where the tubes are not suppressed. And this is the configuration model here. I mean, what I mean by not suppressed, you can suppress them, but keep track that they, there are multiple edges. So we have a probability measure here, which is the one uh, generated by these matchings. And uh, this is the configuration uh, model probability. And you can also define a corresponding Markov chain, which I'm gonna do next. And the way we generated the configuration model, I hope you see, we just created these tubes and then we just permuted them and matched them, right? So they are generated naturally by permutation. So we have the space of permutation with, with every permutation is actually generating for us a, a configuration model. So as such, I mean, you can, you can think of the bipartite model that we had as being injected in this configuration model which itself is is actually coming from the permutation. And the whole goal is to basically compare this one to this one to this one. So yeah, this is really, uh, if you look at the literature of comparison of Markov chains, uh, usually, I mean, I don't wanna state anything which is maybe wrong. Usually what I saw with that, comparison procedure will work very well when you are working on the same state space or when the two state space are not too different. But here for us, as D is growing, 
<laughs> the set of, I mean, the probability that this configuration model generates a simple graph is very tiny. So the set of simple bipartite graph is actually very, very small inside the configuration model. So those comparison procedures become actually much, much harder and inexistent. So uh, as I said, we can uh, talk about the switch chain on the configuration model. You just now have no restriction. You can just pick any two edges and switch them, no matter if they create a multiple edge or not. While before we had the constraint that we are not allowed to create a multiple edge. And uh, the, this, this Markov chain is itself actually uh, inherited from the permutation, the transposition chain on permutation. So you, you had these listed uh, tubes, we just permuted permuted them. This was our probability measure. And uh, the chain we're going to define, we just pick two tubes and permute them. This is the transposition, transposition chain. So they are related one to another. This is actually trivial. And what, what is nice, and this is one example where uh, we can actually use what is known and just do, do comparison <laughs> procedures. So the transposition, transposition chain is very well understood. And Yakonis and Shashahani and Yao and Boel, they actually computed everything. So we know the Poincare constant, we know the logarithmic Solev constant, and we know the MLSI constant. <coughs> so as a consequence, we know the mixing time. And just notice one thing here, one thing, one, one thing here, that if, if you remember, I stated at the beginning bounds on the mixing time in terms of the logarithmic Solev constant and the modified logarithmic Solev constant, here LSI cannot capture the right mixing time because it has an additional log compared to MLSI. So actually, if you want to use functional inequality to capture the right mixing time, you have to use MLSI instead of MLSI. So, uh, so first, first thing to notice is that from permutation model to configuration model is actually very easy to transfer things out just because you have a many, many to one mapping from permutations to configuration model. <coughs> you know exactly how many permutations gives you the same multigraph. You can just track this down, compute everything. Everything is equalities. You have equalities between the Dirichlet forms. So everything is up to a factor, of course, which you can, you can compute because it is the, the multi to one factor, which is happening. So in this respect, passing estimates from the permutation model to the configuration model is actually true. The main difficulty is to do comparison procedure between the multigraphs and, and simple graphs. And this is what the interesting bit here. So uh, let's try to uh, get a Poincaré, let's say Poincaré inequality, just to make things simpler. So we know a Poincaré inequality on the configuration model and we'd like to deduce one on simple graphs, on bipartite graphs. So we start, we start by calculating the variance of, on the bipartite graph and we hope that it is smaller than the variance on multigraph for some extension function f tilde. <coughs> and then we use uh, the Poincaré inequality on this space to bound this one by the corresponding Dirichlet form. And then we hope that the corresponding Dirichlet form is itself bounded by the corresponding Dirichlet form for simple graph. Now, here I say it's actually trivial because what, what, what is the variance doing? You're just picking two points at random and you're comparing the value of the function between the two, right? So if you pick the two, if the two spaces are kind of, of, of comparable size, if you pick them inside, inside in the small space or you pick them in the big space, it doesn't matter too much. Okay, because the size of the two spaces are kind of compared. So this is why when D is fixed, it's much easier. So because you pay the price of the ratio of the size of the two spaces, which is actually a constant, it doesn't matter. When D is growing, something else happens and we're, I'm gonna just mention this a little. <coughs> so what this means is that like you have, the picture I have in mind is that you have, a, this is a general principle in a sense. So you have a, a space here, this is for us the bipartite graphs. This is our space. And you have a bigger space, which is the configuration model. So this is a set of all multigraphs, simple or not. And you have inside here, the one which are simple. And what I said is that I'm calculating the variance of a function, which is defined here. It's actually comparable to the variance of any extension of this function. Now I need to care about the Dirichlet forms. I would like to define the extension F tilde in such a way that the Dirichlet form on the bigger space is actually controlled by the Dirichlet form on, on the small space so that I can use the corresponding Poincaré inequality. But now, I mean, you have, 
you have you have uh, you don't want to worry about the variance if you would like to under to find an extension so that this one is smaller than this one well you better choose a field to be minimizing this dear clip -off. well <coughs> you have a function f defined here and you would like to extend it actually the better picture is usually to write put here as a set of bipartite graph to see it as a boundary so you have a function f defined on the boundary on a boundary set which is a set of bipartite graph and you'd like to extend it to the whole set in such a way to minimize the Dirichlet form well the answer to this we know what it is it is a harmonic extension so the problem is this harmonic extension i have five seconds the harmonic extension is actually hard to analyze so what is the harmonic extension if you pick a point inside and you'd like to define the extension at that point you launch i can one minute yeah uh, you just launch a random walk from this point and wherever it hits the boundary you average on the value on this boundary. Okay. so you can define f tilde the extension at this point as the average over all hitting points on the boundary of the function at, the, at, the, at those points it's so hard to analyze so instead of this what we do is we exhibit a special type of harmonicity instead of these random walks going to the boundary we go straight to the boundary in the sense that we take a pass which goes from a multi-graph to a simple graph by destroying a multi-edge at every step so we allow us to go straight to the boundary this is not always possible but the graph the multi-graph for which this is not possible is tiny so we, we can ignore it. so all of this works very well when we don't have to worry about the variance or the entropy because we only cared about minimizing the harmonic uh, the, the the extension the directly form sorry that's why the harmonic extension works However, when D is growing and when we have to worry about those variance and, and, uh, and the entropy, it turns out that the harmonic extension harmonizes so much the function that it completely kills the global variation. And to recover <coughs> the global variation, we actually define a sort of Gaussian free field, which on average is a, is a harmonic extension, but it kind of recovers because when the points are far, you are kind of almost independent. So you recover kind of those global variation. So that's why just a loose connection to what offer will talk about and all of this is implementing a comparison procedure and since by now we now know that we can add to this some regularization and obtain this comparison procedure also for mlsi we obtain a modified log solve of inequality also for for this switch chain which is extremely important to capture the mixing time because as i said for permutation the mlsi is the one which captures the mixing time not ls voilà that's everything thanks So um, uh, in the in the continuous setting, um, uh, I mean Emmanuel Milman and others have noticed that uh, one thing that allows you to reverse the hierarchy of various functional inequalities is some kind of positive curvature, right? In the some kind of curvature dimension condition, for instance. And uh, you know, in the discrete setting, people have tried to come up with various notions of curvature. Uh, you know, Olivier and Villani, uh, Yao. Uh, Urbar mass. So I was wondering, I mean, your, what, what you're doing to reverse this, not, this amount of regularization you need for a particular chain seems possibly connected to some notion of curvature. Yes. And you make such a connection? Yes, but it's still in the making. So we, we know how to do, uh, we know how to use regularization to get from Bakri Emery type discrete, which is not very natural in the discrete setting, but from Bakri Emery to MLSI, we can do this, but from the Olivier Ricci, which is the more interesting one, is, is we still uh, are stuck. But, uh, but yeah, I perfectly agree. Okay. So that's